Hebrews chapter 6. As we mentioned earlier, this is going to be the last night of our uh, study this quarter, but rest assured in the fall we're going to pick right back up with Hebrews. So we're going to be in the end of chapter 6 as we begin. And If we could get halfway through chapter 7 tonight, I'd be a very, very happy man. We'll see how we do. So we spent a lot of time last week in Hebrews 6 talking about this uh, eternal sin. Uh, if you remember our comparison, anybody remember what TV show we used? Yeah, Walking Dead. I don't know if you saw it in the news or not, but the star of that show is leaving, so we may be seeing the end of it. But it's uh, a way of helping us understand that the person being talked about in Hebrews 6, 4 through 6, is a person who is living in sin and who is unconcerned with the state of their soul, someone that they can't be reached. And so, um, once again, we'll talk about that more when we get over to Hebrews chapter 10. But we left off um, looking at verse, um, well, we'll start in verse 9. Uh, so, somebody, if you would, read Hebrews 6, 9 through 12, nice and loud. So, <coughs> we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved. We feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust, so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name and serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Thank you, Brother David. So we, uh, we went over this a little bit last week, and we'll just recap. Anybody have a copy of the handout? Okay, perfect. There should be some space for you to take some notes. But uh, the writer says there in verse 9, the Hebrews were not yet in a state of apostasy. So he had written about um, that state, but, but reminded them, you're not there yet. But remember, the whole point of writing this, this letter was, to, to urge them not to fall into that state, right? So, so it's telling them to hold on fervently um, to what they know. And so that's sort of another reminder. And we read in chapter 5, oh, I'm sorry, they were unskilled in the word, but here he says they're skilled in good works. And so, of course, we have to strike that balance. And we talked about that a little bit last week. So he tells them as well, keep up the good work, continue the good works that you're doing, but continue to grow in the word and continue to follow the good examples that you're acquainted with. And so this is sort of, uh, after the deep theology, a reminder and a comfort of, hey, these are the things you're doing right, continue to do that. And so um, you think about this in the way, for those of you that, that are parents, uh, the way you deal with your children, right? When your children misbehave, you scold them and you warn them of potential consequences, but then you compliment them for the things that they do right. That second part's pretty important, right? And so uh, here he sort of gives them that, that, that all right, here are the things that can happen to you, the state of apostasy you can fall into, but you're not there yet. And we see your good works and we know the potential you have, so continue to grow in them. And this is, that's sort of where we left off last week. And so we, we're going to get into here to the rest. Um, somebody, if you would, 13, 14, and 15. And we're going to kind of go through this, so make sure we get into chapter 7. 13, 14, and 15. Brent, will you read that for us? multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. Okay, so when we swear, we swear on things. We swear on the Bible. Um, hopefully we don't do this, but sometimes in an argument we'll say, I, I swear, what? I swear to God, or, or I swear on the grave of my dead Uncle Cletus, right? You know, we do all, we swear by these things because we want to swear by things that are more important than us. And so I like this. He says that God, because there was no th nothing greater he could swear by, God swore by himself, right, that, that he would do that. And so he says, God made a promise to Abraham. That's important. And we looked at a little bit last week. God fulfilled those promises to Abraham, right? Remember, he promised to make him the father of nations, promised him a son, promised all those things. He delivered those things and he fulfilled them. And so uh, in verse 15, it says, after he patiently endured, do you remember that whole incident with taking his son 
up to, to kill him, right? And then God, of course, spared him in that way. So it says there that, that he, after he patiently endured, he obtained the promise. So then um, 16, 17, and 18. Uh, Nathan, will you read that for 16, 17, and 18. <laughs> for men indeed swear by the Creator, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Does God determining to show more abundantly to the heir to promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay a hold the hope set before us. Okay, so he's transitioned from the promises made to Abraham to the promises that have been made to us. And so um, there's a big word used here. It's used twice in the New King James. Immutable and immutability. What does that word mean? We got some English teachers I know in here. What does that mean to be immutable? Or what is God's immutability? Dudley? Cannot change. Cannot change. Well, I tell you, that's not where I was expecting the big word definition to come from. Just kidding, Dudley. Um, immutability, right? That God cannot change. Um, and so, uh, or, or well, not even that he can't change, but that he is unchanging. Um, and I want you to think about it this way, right? So, um, the world has changed all around us. I mean, just think about um, who's 75 or older in here. If you, you don't have to raise your hand. Think about how much, man, there's a lot of y'all. Okay. Think about how much the world has changed in your lifetime. Um, you know, that, that, what, what was 75 years ago? 19 what? 1942. What was going on in 1942? World War II. Just think about how different wars are fought, or differently wars are fought now than they were in World War II, right? Uh, that, that's just an amazing thing in itself. Um, do you have TVs in your houses in 1942? No. Now, now, not only do we have TV, we mainly watch TV where? Okay, on our phones, right? That was, that was scheduled. That was supposed to happen. Because uh, the elder wouldn't have his ringtone on in the middle of church. Uh, so so we, we watch them on our phones. I have, a, I have this thing. Um, there ET, there's ETC people in here. I won't say this. So there are other options besides cable now uh, that you can do. So I have the thing called YouTube TV. And so right now, um, um, you know, if I wanted to go and watch something, I, I could watch it. So tomorrow night's game one of the NBA finals. I might not be home when the game starts, but I have through this app on my phone, I can sit and watch live TV and ignore the people around me, right? So um, the world's changed, Dawn. Well, that's a, that's a, are they paying you? Okay, good job. So, um, so, so the, the way we view things has changed, right? Um, the, the way we do those things. Um, you know, uh, what about communication, right? Uh, if you wanted to talk to somebody on the telephone in 1942, what did you have to do? Okay, you had to pick up and, um, I don't know, were those still the two-piece phones that you held up in the 40s? No, so you had the rotary phones? No. Okay, wow, so I'm learning something. So you just, yeah, so yeah, you picked up on the party line and there was this lady. Wouldn't that be weird if you picked up your cell phone and some lady was like, hello? Uh, I guess Siri does that, but you know that. So and th and that that's how you that's how you communicate and talk to people. When did the rotary phone come along? Like the fifties, sixties, maybe. Okay. Maddie, could you use a rotary phone if I brought you one right now? Really? You know how it works? Yeah. It takes like an hour to dial. <laughs> I remember as a kid. No, no joke. I remember as a kid just get, getting fatigued from doing this, and. And if somebody had a one in their phone number and you had to keep doing this over and over, that was aggravating, right? Don't mess up. Right, yeah, right, don't mess up because you got to do it. And, uh, you know, now, now, now it's a lot easier, right? You just, I can, I can right now open my phone and say, okay, Google, call my wife, and, and, and it'll do it for you, right? So the world has changed. Facebook, Instagram, all those things. So, so the world around us has changed. But there are people in this room, and I won't mention any of their names, who have not changed since 1942. <laughs> Some of them are saying, wearing the same undergarments that they were in the 1940s because the way they communicate, the way they do things, the way they operate has, is not going to change. Is it, Brother Curtis? That's right, not going to communicate. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to pull out a flip phone. And so, so, the, so that's how I want you to think of, um, think about it like this, maybe, maybe in another way. Think about... Um, 
There's a big tree around here called the Big Poplar, right? That tree has not changed much, has it? It's there. Winds can come around. Everything can happen. The wind can blow. There can be a hurricane or a tornado. That tree is not going anywhere. That's the way I like to think of immutability. And that's the way I like to think about God. Is that no matter what changes in the world, no matter the way morality, no matter what happens in life, that God remains unchanged. And, and I think that's helpful in understanding the next thing that we're about to talk about. Because it says because of that immutability, because of that unchange, unchanging nature, it says it is impossible for God to lie. And does that mean that God doesn't possess the capability to tell an untruth? No. But it says because of his unchanging nature and his disassociation with anything unrighteous, that we can count on if God says something, he means it. I knew somebody was going to ask that, and I figured it was going to be you. Um, Well, she, well, she, the question that was asked was, if it says that it's impossible for him to lie, doesn't that mean that he doesn't possess the capability to lie? Because I just said the opposite. No, I think it means he chooses not to. Yeah, and I mean, you know, I wish I could answer that question more wholly, but I, I don't know about what God possesses the ability to do. Um, the, the whole point I'm trying to make is that God is all-powerful and can do anything. Um, and so I, I don't want to get into those two. I, re, I really don't know how to answer that question. But the statement that's made is it is impossible for God to lie. So what we can know is that God will not lie, right? Because of His unchanging nature. So I, you know, I, I don't, I don't know, but, but, uh, but that that is something we could ascertain from that. And so, it says we might have strong consolation. So knowing that God doesn't lie, knowing that His truths are there, that's who we want to flee to in times of distress and difficulty, right? So that's kind of where we left off. And then um, somebody, if you would, nineteen and twenty. And there's going to be some stuff that we draw. Out of here. Uh, uh, Daniel, we read those 19 and 20. We have this hope as an anchor for our lives, safe and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. Jesus has entered there on our behalf as a forerunner because he has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Okay. I'm so glad Ken White is not here tonight because I get to tell a story on him. Uh, and don't tell him I told this story, even though it's on camera. Um, so we were talking about this in our men's evo last week, and Ken. Uh, in his past, has liked to have boats. Uh, anybody know how an anchor works? Yeah. Might want to explain to us how, how, how an anchor works, what it does. It Say it, Harvey. It works pretty good most of the time. <laughs> works pretty good most of the time, okay. What, what do you do with anchor, though? Any boaters? Throw it out. Throw it out. Pull on it. Dig into the bottom of the ocean. Okay, so you take this big, heavy thing. Uh, and you throw it, and if you don't want your boat to go anywhere, there's, this is an important step. You tie it off, uh, and then it digs to the ground and holds you in place. Well, Ken told us in this Devo that the first time that he ever got an anchor, he was out on his boat, and he picked the anchor up and threw it into the water, and then went back to the store and bought another anchor. Uh, <laughs> and so he said that uh, a few times later, they were out anchoring, and he tied it off and did all the things, and a few minutes later, he realized the boat was moving. So Ken has lost two anchors. You can tell him that I picked on him. But uh, that's a very important thing, right? Especially if you were in the middle of a storm. You would want to make sure that you had your anchor in the right place. Right? You, want, you would want to make sure that you were um, held as, as, as strong as possible. So this says that that knowledge, that trust in God's promises serves as an anchor for our soul. The New King James says this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. What do other versions say there besides sure and steadfast? I like the, these adjectives. Our hope is what? Besides sure and steadfast. What did you say? Safe and secure. Safe and secure. Anybody else have that little? Firm and secure. Firm and secure. All right, who's got the weird version? It says something different. <coughs> Nobody's using Okay, well, anyway. Uh, so, it, it says there that, that we have that security. So, so. We have these promises. They were made to Abraham. They've been made to us. Because of those, we can have a trust in, in who God is, right? And so we can have that hope as an anchor for our soul. But now we're going to get into some deep theological stuff. So it says, that hope which enters the presence behind the veil. 
Now, what is that an allusion to? The presence behind the veil. The tabernacle and the temple, right? The things that were behind there. And so who had access behind the veil? The high priest. Now, I want you to remember that for the next part of our discussion. So it says... That hope we have as an anchor of the soul, sure and steadfast, and, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So let's, let's ignore the Melchizedek for right now. So let's, let's go back. So it says that, that our hope can enter the presence behind the veil. Now that's significant because throughout the history of Judaism and the life that these people would have come from, it would have been the absolute most disrespectful desecration of anything that was holy for somebody unclean and impure to go behind there. So when the high priest went behind the veil, it was impossible to follow him, right? Are you with me on this? But it says that Jesus has become a forerunner so that he can lead us behind the veil. So, so let's understand this. In, throughout history, you could not enter that. But Jesus has not only led us into the holy place, he's led us behind the veil. What's significant about that? I mean, b besides the fact that it would have been something that Jews would have had a hard time comprehending. But what's significant about that, about that statement? Okay, it's the access to God. That instead of having access to God only through a high priest, Jesus, who now serves as our great high priest, has led us, has torn away the veil, both, both figuratively and literally, right? Do you remember what happened at Jesus' death? The, the, the veil of the temple was torn, right? And so he's, he's pulled back or he's torn that curtain and we are able to enter into the presence of God. That is one of the most theologically beautiful things that, that the, the writer of Hebrews shares with us. And so because of that, Jesus has led us into access with God. And, and that's sort of where he leaves off. So because of that hope we have, that promise that God has is, is given us heaven and it's true, that's sure and steadfast, it's taken us through the veil into the holiest of holies where we have that relationship with God through Christ. All right, we got 20 minutes left. So co thoughts, comments, Janita. Is this going to be a Tate story? No. Oh, man. All right. How many anchors do you think there are at the bottom of the ocean? A bunch. Okay. So we can ascertain that the anchor never moves. So if we know the anchor is the truth, and by study and through our faith and our discipleship and our fellowship, that's how we attach the anchor to our lives. If, if we lose the anchor, it's because we didn't have a good tie down. Yeah, I, I think that's a very valid way of understanding that. Um, and and I, I think your point, too, about every one of us has something that is foundational about who we are. I mean, just think about it in that way. So, uh, and, and, and don't think about it. Let's think about this outside of a religious context. We all have things in our lives that are foundational that are non-negotiable. Um, you know, th there are things about us that are just not going to change. Mark Pettit is not going to retire and buy a condo in downtown Atlanta. <laughs> because a very foundational part of his life, a lot of people are laughing up here. A very foundational part of his life is living in the woods and fighting rattlesnakes and milking cows and that stuff that he does at 5 o'clock in the morning, right? That's a foundational part of who he is. Um, you know, and, and we could we could we could go and, and talk about different ways of understanding that. And so there there is something in our lives that is going to serve as our anchor. And so I think Janita's point is that that if we choose the wrong anchor, we're going to be swept away. But if we choose the right thing, which is the hope of heaven that comes from God to anchor our lives, then we'll be able to, to steady ourselves when difficulties come our way. So I think that's a great way of helping us understand that idea of, of an anchor. Other thoughts or comments? Okay, so let's move on to Melchizedek. Um, so it says that Jesus has a, is a high priest, but not just a high priest. He's a high priest forever according to the order 
of Melchizedek, or Melchizedek, I you choose to, to pronounce that. Okay, so, um, we got into Hebrews chapter 5, and James Barr taught that night, so we're not going to rehash the conversation that you had with him, but we at least know a little something about this guy, Melchizedek, right? So, um, who, who is he? Who was he? Um, We see two references, and I guess we'll take uh, a minute. Leave a marker there in Hebrews 7 and go back all the way to Genesis 14. This is, to me, a fascinating chapter of the Bible. For a lot of reasons. First off, you have this big epic battle that goes on. We've always thought about Abraham in a certain way. As very gentle and meek and obedient. And he was all those things. But what do we read about him in Genesis 14? What else was he? A warrior. He was a military man. A man of might and strength and fury, right? And so there's this big battle between all these kings. And so after the battle is over... And it's sort of a strange narrative because we just read about Abraham and, and he was there in Egypt. He's inherited the promise. He's gone to rescue Lot. And then in chapter 15, we're going to read about God's promise. But here we've got this big battle. Then we go over to, uh, to 18, uh, chapter, uh, verse 18 of chapter 14. Uh, and I guess we'll jump up to 17. It says, the king of Sodom went out, a king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Sheba. That is the king's valley. After his return from the defeat of Keterleon. see what happened. Okay, there we go. And so, he's, uh, after his return and the defeat of Keterleomer and the kings who were with him. And then Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hand, and he gave him a tithe of all. And there, there's more to that story, but we'll stop right there. And so we get over and, and turn over to Psalm 110, 110th Psalm. So there's, that's all there is, is those few verses about Melchizedek in all of the Old Testament. And then we get to Psalm 110. Psalm 110, verse 4. So this is a, this is a, a messianic psalm, psalm of David. Okay, we'll start in verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power in the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning. You have the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Can you imagine David in this psalm and people reading it and going, who in the world is Melchizedek? And who is this talking about that he's going to be a priest forever? According, why is that phrase strange, a priest forever? Because priests don't live forever, and when a priest dies, what do you do immediately? You replace him. But whoever this is talking about is going to be a priest forever according to the order or, or just like this other guy named Melchizedek. So, so I, I, my question, who is this guy? Who is Melchizedek? And these are a few theories. This is from a, a famous Lutheran commentator named Linsky, and, and they're lists all over the place. But I, I like what he says. Uh, he lists a few. So in 135 B.C., this uh, Rabbi Ismail and then Martin Luther and several other scholars have agreed with him. Uh, believe that it is Shem, who is one of the sons of who? Of Noah. So that's who they believe that this Melchizedek is, one of the sons of Noah, which would have been significant because of who Shem was and that he survived the flood and all that. So, so that's who, it, I don't know. Another possibility, uh, Philo, very famous one of, of the early Christian writers, says that he was not a person at all, that he is not a real 
historical figure, but he's an amalgamation of all these godly people put together. And so he explains this theory. I'm not going to explain to you all the, but you can go and read it for yourself. Um, Origen says that he was an angel. That he was not a person at all. He would have been an angel. So, uh, as some of you suggested last week in our discussion, maybe this was Jesus himself, the pre-incarnate incarnation of Christ. Some have suggested this was uh, uh, an incarnation of the Holy Spirit coming down to, to meet Abram. Any other, any other suggestions? What do you think? Any other ideas about who Melchizedek was? Okay. I don't understand uh, why Shem. Yeah, I don't either. You'll have to ask Martin Luther uh, about that. But that's one of the predominant theories. It, 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 you can't make that comparison with Jesus of Melchizedek being having a beginning and having an end. Jesus had no beginning and no end. Okay. Jesus was high priest. Jesus is a king over the kingdom. Yeah, so hold on to that because that is a very important concept. The idea of no beginning, no end. We're going to hopefully get to it here in the next little bit. So, so here, here's, here's one of the things that happened. I was talking with a buddy who was writing on Hebrews earlier today. Um, in the intertestamental period, people became fascinated with Melchizedek. Um, and throughout the historical understanding, it had been pretty... Uh, well documented that Melchizedek was, as was just pointed out, uh, a man. That he was the king of Salem and that he was uh, a priest of God. So what has sort of happened around him is people took this and people that were very good students of, of, of biblical literature and said, nowhere else do we see anybody like this or do we see uh, somebody mentioned so randomly yet referenced by King David in a song. And so sort of this lore began to go around. And, and so all these theories came to light, right? I've read where uh, Salem was an early name for Jerusalem. Yes. Hold on to that. We're about to get to that in just a minute. Uh, but yes. And so that would be important as well. And so here's what I want us for the purpose of this. And, and this is what I believe. And I believe it pretty strongly. And, and I, I believe that Melchizedek was a man. He was a very important man in the scheme of how we understand who Jesus is. But, but he was a man. I don't think that he was God brought down on earth. I don't think he was an angel. I don't think he was some sort of spirit. I certainly don't think he was Shem. Um, one of the three students just four one something. <laughs> so, uh, sort of, we're going to go moving forward on the premise that Melchizedek was a man. And so, let, let's sort of hold on to that. So, let, let's read a little bit of the text, and then we'll, and then we'll get into this um, comparison chart that I made here. Um, Hebrews 7, starting in verse 1. For this Melchizedek, the king of Salem. So, uh, let's, two things right here in the first sentence that are important. I may be walking out of range with maybe what's happening, I'm sorry. But, <clears throat> uh, the name Melchizedek is a compound word in Hebrew. It simply means a king of righteousness. So, the name itself means king of righteousness. The king of righteousness. And then he was the king of Salem. The word Salem means peace. So before we get into his title, I think it's important to understand about him that he was both the king of righteousness and the king of peace. And that's going to be important as we look at his chart of him. And so somebody brought the point out, Salem. There are two predominant theories about where Salem was. And they have to do with Abram's journey in this period. The um, most predominant theory is that this was Jerusalem. This uh, Valley of the Kings would have been near Jerusalem. It would have been in his path. So people have concluded that it must have been Jerusalem. Salem turning into Jerusalem wouldn't make a lot of sense. That's a predominant theory. If you were to really press me, that's what I would say. But Jerome, who is very important in the history of understanding God's Word, and, and others believe because of some archaeological evidence and some other things that um, it is uh, another city that is a little north of Jerusalem. It would have been a city near Shechem. It's referenced in the book of Genesis. And that um, they believe that they have uncovered some remains of Melchizedek's kingdom. And so really, it's in a very small area. But some people believe it's here. Some people believe it's here. 
But we know that in some place, he's the king of a place that represents the name peace. So then it says that Melchizedek was the king of Salem, the priest of the most high God. Now, now why is that significant that he's called a priest? A priest of God. No such thing as a priest of God here, is there? You read about any other priests before Genesis chapter 14? No. Uh, David? So the question along that I have is that, you know, in Cain and Abel, we don't hear about them being told how to sacrifice, but yet they did. So is this just a facilitator of sacrifices of people? Or? I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, because it, it, as, as you pointed out, in this patriarchal age, it seemed that God communicated directly with people to explain their sacrifice. And so here we know this person was a priest, as you mentioned, to, to represent God to these people. And so that's one of the reasons he just jumps out as unique, because to even see the word priest in Genesis 14 is, is really unique to our understanding of that priesthood uh, system. So uh, before we get even more bogged down in that, so he's... The, the king of righteousness, the king of peace, and a priest of the most high God. So we know who is the most high God? Jehovah. Yahweh, right? The most high God. Who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings. There have been a lot of people who have been offended by that phrase, slaughter of the kings, throughout history. And in the NIV, I believe it says the feet of the kings. Is that right? Uh, some of your versions may be something else. It's just referencing the battle that took place there. The five kings against the four kings in the chapter of Genesis 14. And he blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness. That's the name Melchizedek. And then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. So here is where the mystical element of Melchizedek comes from. Yes, because how can he be a man if he was born, he, was, he did not have a father, a mother, no genealogy? Yeah. Genealogy is something that you can do. You can only earth. Uh, and he has no beginning of days, nor end of life. That means that he still exists. Yeah. Okay. So, so that's, that's really what bothers me. I can't. Yeah. And so even more interestingly, that word that means without genealogy in Greek is a word that doesn't exist elsewhere in Greek literature. The Hebrew writer, whoever he was, made up a word to explain what it means to be without genealogy. And so the confusion has come in the fact that we don't live in the culture of first century Judaism. Because everything that mattered to them had to do with what? Genealogy and where you came from. And specifically for the priests, that was everything. Because if you wanted to be a priest, where did you have to come from? You had to come from the Levitical tribe. You had to come from the descendants of Aaron. Did Melchizedek come from the descendants of Aaron? Did Jesus come from the descendants of Aaron? No. He came from the line of which tribe? Judah, of course, line of Judah. So, um, and so it seems like what the author is getting at here is that Melchizedek was called a king and a priest, which was never happened before. And he was a person that didn't have a father that belonged to any Jewish or Jewish um, important Jewish tribe or, or Jewish designation. He didn't have a father that would have been of that line. He didn't have a genealogy that would have made him a priest. It says having neither beginning of days nor end of life. That means that his priesthood was never taken away like the, like the priests of that day would have been. But he was made like the Son of God and remains a priest continually. And that, that is a phrase that trips us up, remains like a Son of God. Well, Bless you. Okay. Right. And so that gets us into this discussion that we could spend hours talking about um, types in the Bible. Like, I'll, I'll explain it to you this way. In 1 Peter chapter 3, um, it says that... Um, that baptism is a type, or, or some of the versions say an anti-type, right? And so what is, what is uh, something that happened in history that was similar to baptism, that, that was a type of baptism? Well, before that, the, the flood, right? So let's think about it this way. 
Is the, was the flood baptism? No. no. But in the flood, God saw sin, needed a way to destroy sin, and used water to do that. Would that be a pretty simple understanding of what the flood was? Yeah. Baptism, God sees sin in our lives, needs a way to destroy it, uses water to represent the blood of Christ, and destroy sin in the water. Is that an accurate description of baptism? Are those the same thing? No. They're types. They're similar. This is the same thing that's going on here with Melchizedek and Jesus. Melchizedek and Jesus are, are the only two people in the Bible to, to, to wear the term priest and king simultaneously. But they're not the same person. They are, they are a type. And Melchizedek's existence, people have wondered, oh, why in the world did this man even exist? Why is he included? The entire reason that Melchizedek existed, the whole reason his narrative is in the pages of the Bible, is to help us and to help these people understand who Jesus was. It's a very simple thing and, and to understand, but because of our desire to, to understand things in a different way, I think it's been uh, misapplied and misunderstood a little bit. So, um, we're going to have to stop there. I want to look at this chart really fast. And then, uh, we've got, you've got to help me remember when we start back at the uh, beginning of September, we're picking up after the introductory phrasing of um, Hebrews 7. And that's about halfway anyway, so that's okay. So this is a chart to help us understand this comparison between Jesus and Melchizedek. Melchizedek was called the king of righteousness and the king of peace. Jesus is a king. He's a king from the line of David, but he's the king of what kind of kingdom? Spiritual one. Uh, that's what John 18 says. He was being questioned in John 18, 36. He says, my kingdom is what? Not of this world. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Anybody know what that says off the top of your head? Somebody turn there real, real fast. Isaiah 9, 6. We used to do this thing when I was a kid uh, called Bible Sword Drill. So the teacher would call out the verse. And whoever got there the fastest got like a piece of candy or a star or something. Uh, and so that's how I learned where the books of the Bible were real fast. Nathan wins our gold prize tonight. Go ahead. Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child was born. The government will be upon his shoulders. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Prince of Peace. So Jesus was a king just like Melchizedek. He was a king of peace just like Melchizedek. So Melchizedek and Jesus are both kings. Melchizedek was a priest before Aaron was a priest. So, and, 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 I, and I stand behind this statement. Since he was a priest before Aaron, he was a priest greater than Aaron because he was a priest outside of that construct that God had established. And in Hebrews chapter 5, we won't rehash that argument, but we read that Jesus is a priest also greater than Aaron. So that's something else they have in common. They're both kings. They're both, both priests greater than that Levitical priesthood. Melch this one may be a bit of a stretch, but I, I think there is some application here. Melchizedek brought to Abraham bread and wine. When Jesus entered... Uh, instituted the Lord's Supper, what were the two elements? Unleavened bread and, and wine. So there's another parallel. And then the final one. Melchizedek was a priest to all. Were the people that were living in Salem in this time of Melchizedek Jews? No. What made the people have that relationship with God at this time? Obedience to God. And what was one of the other symbols? Okay, so we'll get into that another time too. But, but it's that relationship with God. That's what made them have that. So he was a priest, but did he also not serve as a priest to Abraham? He was a priest to all. Just like Jesus, who in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14, it says he broke down that middle wall of separation and brought salvation to the Jews and the Gentiles. So you're starting to see how Jesus is in the order of Melchizedek. He's a priest forever. Melchizedek was a king, Jesus was a king. Melchizedek was a priest, Jesus was a priest. He brought bread and wine, Jesus brought bread and wine. He was a priest to all, just as Jesus remains our high priest today. And so throughout the rest of chapter 7, 8, 9, and even into 10, it's going to talk about how Jesus is a high priest and how, remember this as one of the main themes for our discussion, the law of Christ is greater than the law of Moses and helping us understand why that is the case. Did I answer any of your questions about Melchizedek? Okay, hopefully so. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about him when we resume the class in, the, in September. But 
a very interesting thing. Maybe we can do a little question and answer or, a, or maybe a sermon about helping us understand this parallel more. Hebrews is an interesting book. It's, it's a book that's weighty and it takes a, a lot of time to go through. So we'll take a break for the summer series and then we'll resume that back in September. Any questions or, uh, or comments? All right, not listed to be dismissed with a word of prayer. God, we're so thankful for another opportunity tonight to, to study some of the meat of Scripture. And the more we study, the more amazed we are by your son, by his role in our lives, by his, by his priesthood, by his kingship, and most importantly, by his love for us. And we pray that we continue to grow, that we continue to study Scripture, and that we can let the power of your word reign in our lives. Be with us as we separate and bring us back on Sundays. Through Jesus we pray. Amen.